Today's scripture reading is found in Psalms 42 and 43. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I will go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God my God. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation and my God. Good morning, I'm Pastor Michael. It's great to have you with us this morning. I wanna thank Myra for the reading of the passage this morning. If you notice, we um, put two Psalms together, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. And the reason is because these songs were actually considered uh, one in the same. They were part of the same song. And they're two parts of a single close-knit poem. And uh, commentator Derek Kidner said this about this psalm. He said, this is one of the most sadly beautiful songs in the collection. Sadly beautiful. I think we agree on that. This is a lament. Gorgeous, gorgeous psalm. But it is a lament of a temple musician who's in the north. We don't know why. He's exiled. He is 150 miles from Jerusalem, dislocated from gathered worship, uh, God's people, the temple, the place of God's living presence. And there he is, disconnected, and he longs to come back home. He wants life to return to the way it used to be. So we can relate to his lament, his despair. And so because of that, I want us to take a look at the teaching here and uh, just acknowledge some things, allow these things to come to the surface because through the pandemic and through uh, the social unrest that our nation has experienced, uh, the floodgates have been opened to many unexpected and complicated emotions. Questions, how do you face these emotions? The despair, 
and keep on going. When you struggle with difficult emotions like despair, despondency, depression, what keeps you going? Well, what kept this worshiper of God going? You know, we live in what seems to be a culture of death. Not just having a virus take people's lives, but this is an experience of the death of a life that we have cherished. And many things we're told are not coming back. Many restaurants are closing for good. Things have changed quite a bit. And our hopes, maybe your hopes have been dashed to pieces or deferred or delayed. So I think that this really speaks to us this morning. So what we want to do is, first of all, get excited about the fact that this psalm is speaking to us almost like a mirror being held up to our souls. And it allows us to see what's going on inside. In fact, John Calvin called the psalms the anatomy of the human soul. So what's exciting is you see every emotion on display in the Psalms, the range of emotions, love, joy, but also frustration, sorrow, despair. And so here's an example of a person with a troubled heart trying to follow God in a fallen, broken, and badly damaged world. So if this is the anatomy of the soul, God is our soul doctor, the physician of the soul. And so he's the expert in our soul. And so since he's the expert of that which he created, we come to the doctor for diagnosis and for cure. So when you go to a doctor and you have symptoms, the doctor first asks, what are those? And you write them down or you tell him your complaint. And so that's what we see here. We have some vivid, vivid language about despair's symptoms. So we're going to break it down this way. We're going to begin with despair symptoms and try to understand the causes of the symptoms and then the cure, how to treat it. How does God treat these maladies. Okay, so number one, let's take a look at despair's symptoms. So what we notice right away is that you have these vivid word pictures. They're almost like video, right? Poetic. And they're not really just static images. You can see what's going on. You can imagine what's going on in these images because these are action images. Things are taking place. And so what the psalmist does is he communicates his emotions and his feelings through his art, through his artistry, his poetry, his, his song. Um, he is a temple musician, so he has a stringed instrument called a lyre, L-Y-R-E, that we see mentioned. And so this is how he thinks um, in terms of pictures. So the first picture we see, which speaks about the symptom of the soul, the, the, the emotions, and just what's going on deep inside is this picture of a deer in verse 1. As a deer pants for, slowing, for flowing streams. As a deer pants for flowing streams. So my soul pants for you, oh God. So, you know, we would be um, mistaken if we pictured a deer by a stream. That's not what's being spoken of here. The picture or video for us is of a deer looking for a flowing stream. The deer is parched. This is not a cute picture of Bambi, you know, just having a good time at the stream. This is a deer in crisis. And there's danger for this deer. 
and there's danger for the soul because there's a prevailing drought pictured here. And so that means that there's thirst and this deer is panting hard and quickly, breathing out, <sighs> gasping, gasping. Just the throat, the tongue is dry, dry as dust. And it speaks about our danger, the psalmist's danger that he was experiencing, that he was experiencing an absence of God's presence, just as the deer was experiencing an absence of water. So, next picture. In verse 3, he says, My tears have been my food day and night. And so what we see here, besides the thirst, you see the turmoil. The turmoil within, right? So he captures this, right? He's crying, and tears are streaming down his face, and he's eating his tears, right? Tears coming down, the turmoil within, the sadness. And then you see the taunting, the taunting of the enemies, okay? And it says that the enemies in verse 3 say to him all day long, where's your God? This is picked up later on as well. But in verse 10, as a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. These are harmful, hurtful words. And so what's going on here? is tremendous tumult, anguish. Then you see the fourth picture, torrents of water, okay? In verse six, he says, my soul is cast down within me, cast down, pushed down. That's, that's the sensation, right? The symptom, feeling pushed down. He says, therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Okay, these were mountain ranges in the north, so far from the safety and the home of his home in Jerusalem. And verse 7, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. So you see, here you have first an absence of water. Then you have water streaming down, you know, uh, the tears. And then you have this torrent of water. It's like a fire hose, right? You can't drink from a fire hose, right? It'll bruise you. It'll probably break your bones if you stand too close. And so what's going on here? He's speaking of this sensation of being pounded with water, pummeled. It's like there are two waterfalls pictured that join together. Okay, and they're communicating, they're speaking to one another, and here he is underneath, underneath the pressure. And it's like a cruel joke, and he's being suffocated, suffocated under this wall of water. It's a picture, friends, of despair. So we get this. We get the turmoil, the despair, the sadness. He says in verse 5 that his soul is cast down in turmoil, cast down, he's in despair. So God's providence is bringing on these circumstances. We face despair, friends, by first acknowledging the symptoms. We, be, we're, we become self-aware. There are two tendencies. One is to ignore the symptoms, to downplay them, and have sunny optimism. And the other extreme is to indulge them, to be led by those emotions. And neither one is the right way to address the situation. We must acknowledge the symptoms and not be led by them. And understand that to be emotionally and spiritually healthy, we're in touch with our pain, but we have to do something with that pain. Instead of being led by it, we lead the pain. We lead the pain to God. And so these symptoms lead us to understand the causes. Now, what's the cause of this uh, psalmist's despair? Well, 
of course, spiritual dryness. There's a darkness there. But when you look at some of what is spoken of, you see just how causes interact with one another. Okay? So the main cause is he's dislocated from the living presence of God in Jerusalem, in the temple. Okay? He's far from home. We can all relate to being dislocated from the life that we used to live. But I want you to see what's happening here, too. A physical cause here, not a primary cause, but a physical cause, which probably exacerbates, worsens the whole thing, is he's lost his appetite. He's not eating, he's not sleeping, and you can't downplay that. That is something that's going on with him. But also, besides physical, there's something vocationally going on. He's away from his job, right? He would lead the procession, right? And he was a musician in the temple. But now he's furloughed. We don't know why. He's exiled, and he's not doing his work. And there's a sense, a big sense, in which our work, done for the glory of God and the good of others, nourishes us. But we also see that there is a relational cause, okay? a social cause. You know, being around followers of God, fellow travelers, is an edifying and spiritual experience. Well, mostly. But the presence of God comes to us through other spiritual journeyers. And here it says that he, he is fed. He has been fed by the beauty and the joy. He needs the festive throng. And what they would do is before they went into the temple, they would meet outside and it would be like a parade and music and they would interact with one another and they would go in together. And he was fed by that. He was fed by being around other believers. And we need, and we miss, don't we? Many of us really miss being with one another. We miss the body of Christ. And we need the body of Christ to be whole and complete. So he misses that. But also there's a psychological cause here. He has enemies. And this is prompting him to wonder, well, where's God? My enemies are here. The presence of my enemies are big. They're, they're, they're taunting me. They're mocking me. They're committing injustice, oppression. They're scheming against him with deceit. But where's God? Have you ever been hammered by accusations, insinuations, opposition by adversaries? Well, he is, but unjustly so. And these could be spiritual enemies, too. You know, the scripture says that in the unseen realm, there's certainly spiritual beings. Like, for instance, Satan is called the accuser. And he's a liar. And he, he's about the business of confusing us and trying to lie and mislead us. So there, there might be some of that going on. And certainly in our lives, we are experiencing enemies, all kinds of enemies, or people who set themselves up as, as our enemy in opposition to us. But also, there's spiritual separation. This is the first thing, and I wanted to get back to this. He is dislocated from God's living presence in the temple, and he can't wait to get back. He feels abandoned by God and hopes God will come to him again. And he doesn't quite understand what's going on. But his faith, his trust in God, is seeking to understand this. Okay, so he's working it through. He's, he's looking at his symptoms, okay? He's allowing God to create something beautiful from that. He's in touch with his, his um, spiritual health, his emotional health. And he's tracing those back to the causes, but this is the number one cause. And so he understands that this is a perfect storm and he's experiencing spiritual dryness primarily because God is not showing up the way that God used to show up and meet him. So my question for you is this, 
are you feeling, to what extent are you feeling this? That God is absent in your despair? Do you feel that he's near? He's close? Are you meeting God? Do you feel a sense of his sweet, kind, but also powerful presence? Maybe you're not. Maybe you feel distanced. Distanced from God. And I want to encourage you not to downplay the power of meeting together. Now, we are not meeting together for obvious reasons. We hope when it's safe to do so, we will do that with uh, wisdom. But Barna Research Group reports that one out of three practicing Christians have actually stopped attending church during this pandemic. And so I've actually seen the same stat, about one out of three people who have been associated with Ascension Church, who consider Ascension Church their spiritual home, about one out of three I have not seen. I've not seen online. Um, I haven't been able to connect with by phone or by text, or at least minimally. And that is worrisome. And so the thing is, many people do make excuses that when life returns to normal in society, well, we'll be back to church. And the question is, well, what's going on now? We need water for our thirsty souls. So what we have to do is look at what's going on. What is behind the despair in our lives or the despondency? Now, it could be that you're like the psalmist and you've done everything you could and there's no real reason why you're sensing God's absence. Okay? Maybe, you know, there are times when God, in a sense, takes a step back to draw you closer to him. And that's by design. And that's a really good thing that happens quite often. But maybe because you're in a relationship with God, maybe you've done something to hurt that relationship. And God is not allowing you to experience his presence because he wants you to repent. Maybe you're experiencing it in conviction and a guilty conscience. So use that. Allow God to lead you back to him. If there's something you need to confess, if you need to get right with God, get right with God. So I just said this absence, this despair may not be your fault at all, or minimally so, or it really may be. Maybe there's something going on that you have to take care of between you and God. Well, whatever the case, our response to what's going on is usually fraught and filled with difficulty. And so there are layers to our despair, okay? But the best thing about this passage is this, that the passage teaches us what despair's cure is. You see, up to this point, we've talked about, we've talked about the bad news. You know, the symptoms that we feel that we can articulate, that we should not ignore, that we should not be led by, you know, those, those emotions. And we've also seen that we should try to understand the underlying causes, though there are layers of causes and situations that um, make um, this worse. We need to be able to be wise about what's going on. But now, here's the good news. Despair is cure. The question then for us is this, how do you receive the living presence of God? How do you get your thirst quenched? How do you enjoy this living, these living streams of water that God is providing for you? Well, the psalmist says in verse 5, he says that when you bring yourself to God, you first start by questioning yourself. He says, why are you cast down, my soul? See what he's doing? He's confronting his soul. He's questioning his soul. 
Why are you in turmoil within me? And this is a refrain. It occurs three times. Here in verse 5 of 42, then in verse 11, and then again the next chapter, 43, 5. It's the same refrain. And so, how does he resolve this problem? He says to himself, hope in God. This is message to self. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. He really needs to preach the good news to himself. And so do we. But for him to get to the point where he says, my hope is in God. This is the cure all. This is the thing that's going to address my despair. This is the thing that's going to bring water to my parched and thirsty soul. For him to do that, he has to understand the hope that he has. And like us, I'm sure he has had to deal with false hopes. So what we do here, before we look at this hope, this promise that God gives us, that we, we, we drink from, that we live with every single day, this wonderful promise that replenishes our souls, and makes us healthy and well. Again, before we do that, we have to look at false hopes. And briefly, we have to understand that there are substitute hopes. Okay? We could put our hope in the wrong thing and not God. And this is whenever we fall short and we sin. We're always putting our hope in things that we believe will bring us hope and happiness and satisfy us. But, you know, to fight despair with hope means to talk to yourself, not just about the true hope, but about these false hopes. So we have to fight and break through. Really, what's here? And this is interpretation, okay? Because many times, I don't know about you, but my despair, my despondency, my, my sadness, my sorrow often has to do with my expectations of what is the good life, what will bring me happiness, where I put my hope, and then the hope gets dashed or delayed, a situation doesn't work out the way I wanted it to, and then I'm down. My soul is cast down, it's like pushed down, you feel it. Sometimes you feel so suffocated. But you see, we have to do the hard work of asking ourselves, what have I put my hope in that is against this wonderful vertical hope that God gives us? Because all those other hopes are horizontal. They're all horizontal. And so we have these hopes and we try to fill our souls, the river of our souls, with things that are not living water. So can you imagine, right, your body needs water, physical water. But imagine if you were drinking soda all the time, sweet, sugary soda. Coca-Cola, for instance. Love Coca-Cola, maybe, right? I don't want to get sued by Coca-Cola. But if you just fill your body with Coca-Cola, you will not experience health. And so that's an example of a false hope of a substitute. And so this is a time, friends, this pandemic, this time of social unrest, our disenchantment with the government and the way that we're being led. This is a time for each of us to really sort through our hopes and ask which are the hopes that we have brought to God that we can pin on God, okay, in a way that show that we trust him. And what are the hopes that we are taking and using alongside of God or apart from God? The things that will bring disappointment and disenchantment because everything has a shelf life. We'll always be disappointed when we put our energy into these horizontal hopes because 
every horizontal hope is here today and gone on another day. Everything. And the scariest, most threatening thing is death. Now, which leads us to this living hope. Remember I said that we get this living water by going to the source of hope? It's a living hope because this hope is God himself. And the New Testament speaks about this hope in terms of the resurrection. This is the only reason, the only reason we know that God has given us for hope. Really, the only future that we have is a settled future. It's a future that's been dealt with because our greatest enemy, the greatest threat to our existence, greatest threat to our relationship with God and these living waters, the living presence of God has been dealt with by Jesus Christ. And this is a sturdy hope because it's vertical. You know, Jesus said that he offered the living water in John 7. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Earlier in John 4, he says, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst, but the water I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This, friends, is a living hope that comes to the resurrection. And it's really odd. Later on, it's oddly beautiful that when Jesus is hanging on, a cro on the cross, one of his last sentences was, I thirst. Can you imagine that? The one who created water, the one who created the waterfalls, the oceans, the rivers, human bodies, sentient beings, the one who is the living water, the very living presence of the triune God. Here he is on the cross. I thirst. Why is that? Well, this shows us his work. That in order to provide living water for us, he had to go without. He had to take his privilege and he had to come down and surrender his privileges of being God so he can go to the cross and die our death, the death that we should have died so we can live the life, the life we don't deserve, the life that he provides, a life of living water, a life of satisfaction, a life filled with hope. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us this living water. And I pray that you would teach us through this set of Psalms what it is like to experience more and more the living water that you have promised us. And Lord, when we are dry, it makes us wonder. It makes us wonder about ourselves. It makes us wonder about where we are in relation to you. And Lord, teach us what we need to do in order to receive your grace, whether we are standing in the way in some way, or whether we have even received your grace at all. And for those who have not received this grace, this beautiful living water, this fountain of living water, I pray that you would help them to do business with you and give them help and give them hope to trust in you. And Lord, for the church, as we are just scattered, we're scattered uh, in different places, Lord, on Sunday morning and throughout the week, pray that you, you would give us just a real desire to meet again and that we would be fed by the hope that you give us as we're united to you in faith, as a community, and as our God. In Jesus' name.